Lobby and the Second Lebanon War In the summer of 2006, Israel fought a 34-day war against Lebanon. On the 12th of July, Hezbollah, the Shia organization that controls the southern part of Lebanon, made a cross-border raid that killed and captured several Israeli soldiers. In response, the Israel Defense Forces launched a major air campaign in Lebanon, which killed more than 1,100 Lebanese, most of whom were civilians, and roughly a third of whom were children. It also did extensive damage to Lebanon's infrastructure, including roads, bridges, office buildings, apartment buildings, gas stations, factories, water pumping stations, airport runways, homes, and supermarkets although virtually no one challenged Israel's right to respond to the raid or to defend itself. Its excessive response was widely condemned around the globe. Despite strong support from the United States, Israel failed to achieve its military or political objectives and Hezbollah emerged from the war with its popularity and prestige significantly enhanced. The IDF's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Dan Halatz, resigned a few months later, and an official Israeli government investigation chaired by former Supreme Court Justice Eliyahu who Winograd subsequently issued a scathing assessment of Israel's planning and handling of the war. In particular, the Winograd Commission found that Israel's leaders had failed to consider the whole range of options, failed to adapt the military way of operations and its goals to the reality on the ground, and pursued goals that were not clear and could not be achieved, the war was also a major setback for the United States. It weakened the Sinira government in Beirut, whose election after the Cedar Revolution of 2005 had been one of the few successes in the Bush administration's Middle East policy. The war also solidified the informal alliance among Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran, and intensified anti-American attitudes throughout the region, thereby undermining the war on terror and complicating U.S. efforts to forge a regional consensus on Iraq and Iran. How did this happen? Although primary responsibility for mishandling the war lies with Israel's leaders, the United States encouraged their mistakes by offering them unconditional support before and during the war. Israel had briefed the Bush administration on its plans to go after Hezbollah well before the war began on the 12th of July and was given a tacit green light by Washington. Unlike the rest of the world, including virtually all the major democracies, the United States did not criticize Israel's actions during the war and gave it valuable diplomatic and military backing instead. The Israel lobby worked throughout the war to keep the United States in Israel's corner. It did not make strategic sense for the Bush administration to back Israel's disproportionate response to Hezbollah's provocations, and there was also no compelling moral case for supporting Israel's conduct. America's uncritical backing was not in Israel's interest either. As the Winograd report suggests, Israel would have been much better off if its leaders had examined the whole range of options. In other words, the United States would have been a better ally if it had urged a different course of action when Israel first outlined its plan to attack Lebanon. Had the United States done so, Israel would have been forced to come up with a smarter response and might have avoided the debacle that subsequently befell it in Lebanon. Israelis and many of their American supporters do not want to admit that the lobby heavily influenced US policy both before and during the Second Lebanon War, and they offer several alternative explanations designed to counter this charge. As is the case in other contexts, some defenders argue that the US government's unflinching support for Israel's assault reflects the American public's deep commitment to the Jewish state. The American people, in this view, wanted U.S. leaders to back Israel to the hilt. And so President Bush and the Congress were simply bowing to the will of the people. Others claim that Israel was acting as America's client state in its war with Hezbollah. According to this version of events, the Bush administration was the driving force behind the war and it got its loyal Israeli client to do its bidding. These alternative explanations might seem intuitively plausible to some observers, but neither is consistent with the available evidence. The pre-war planning Israel has launched a number of major military strikes against Lebanon over the past 40 years, but it previously had fought only one genuine war on Lebanese territory, under the leadership of Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Defense Minister Ariel Sharon. Israel invaded Lebanon in June 1982. It was 18 years before the IDF finally left Lebanon, and it was Hezbollah that drove them out. Israel and Hezbollah remained bitter in knees even after Israel withdrew and occasional skirmishes continued to take place along the Israeli-Lebanese border. It was just such a skirmish on the 12th of July, 2006, that erupted into Israel's second war in Lebanon. Concerned about the huge stockpile of missiles and rockets that Hezbollah had acquired from Syria and especially Iran, Israel had been planning to strike at Hezbollah for months before the 12th of July abductions. Gerald Steinberg, a well-connected Israeli strategist, made these points during the war, of all of Israel's war since 1948. This was the one for which Israel was most prepared. In a sense, 
The preparation began in May 2000, immediately after the Israeli withdrawal, when it became clear the international community was not going to prevent Hezbollah from stockpiling missiles and attacking Israel. By 2004, the military campaign scheduled to last about three weeks that we're seeing now had already been blocked out and, in the last year or two, it's been simulated and rehearsed across the board. Similarly, Seymour Hirsch reported, Several current and former officials involved in the Middle East told me that Israel viewed the soldiers kidnapping as the opportune moment to begin its planned military campaign against Hezbollah. Hezbollah, like clockwork, was instigating something small every month or two. The US government consultant with ties to Israel said, indeed, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert told the Winograd Commission that his decision to respond to the abduction of soldiers with a broad military operation was made as early as March 2006 which was four months before the conflict started. At that time, he asked to see the ex-Isting operational plans for war with Lebanon, because he did not want to make a snap decision in the case of an abduction. Olmert also said that in November 2005, his predecessor, Ariel Sharon, ordered the army to prepare a list of targets for a military response in Lebanon after a failed Hezbollah attempt to capture IDF troops in a border village. Olmert held his first meeting on Lebanon in early January 2006, Four days after he was appointed to replace the incapacitated Sharon, and he subsequently held more meetings on the situation in Lebanon than any of his recent predecessors, wrote in the New York Review of Books well before the Second Lebanon War, an open advocate of preemptive war against Syria and Hezbollah, a position favored by neoconservatives in and close to the Bush administration. When Seymour Hirsch reports, as quoted above, that Israel was interested in getting the support of Cheney's office and the Middle East desk of the National Security Council. He is effectively saying that Almut wanted the approval of Abrams and Wormser, which he surely got. Beyond that basic fact, which is neither surprising nor controversial, little is known about the Bush administration's planning role in the months before the Second Leb Anon War. Nothing in this account suggests that either Israel or the United States was conspiring to provoke a war in Lebanon. Given the simmering tensions along the border and Israel's legitimate concerns about Hezbollah's missiles and rockets, it made perfect sense for the IDF to formulate plans for addressing this threat. After all, every competent military leadership plans for contingencies that may never arise. It also made perfect sense for Israel to consult with its American patron about its plans, to make sure it was not preparing for a course of action that Washington might oppose. The mighty edifice of support. Once the war began and Israel came in for severe criticism from all corners of the globe, the Bush administration provided Israel with extraordinary diplomatic protection. Its UN ambassador, John Bolton, whom Israel's UN ambassador once jokingly described as a sixth member of the Israeli delegation, vetoed a Security Council resolution that criticized Israel and worked assiduously for about a month to prevent the UN from imposing a ceasefire, so that Israel could try to finish the job with Hezbollah for Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice downplayed the violence at a press conference at one point dismissing it as the birth pangs of a new Middle East act only when it became apparent that the IDF was not going to win a decisive victory did the Bush administration and Israel recognize the need for a ceasefire. During the ensuing negotiations that led to UN Resolution 1701, the United States went to great lengths to protect Israel's interests. In fact, as the resolution was being finalized, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert called President Bush on the 11th of August and thanked him for safeguarding Israel's interests in the Security Council. The president frequently defended Israel's actions in public and never uttered a critical word. UN Ambassador Bolton told the Security Council that Hezbollah's goal was to deliberately target innocent civilians, to desire their death, while the disproportionate numbers of Lebanese civilians killed by Israel were the sad and highly unfortunate consequences of self-defense. In addition to this diplomatic support, the administration provided Israel with military intelligence during the conflict, and when Israel started running low on precision, guided bombs, the president quickly agreed to send replacements during the height of the war. It successfully pressed Turkey and Iraq to deny permission to a plane loaded with missiles for Hezbollah to cross Turk. Ish and Iraqi airspace on its way from Iran to Damascus. As Shea Feltman, a well-connected Israeli scholar, noted during the latter stages of the war, there is huge, huge appreciation here for the president because we have seen in other contexts, Israel usually finds its strongest up, port in the US Congress, and congressional behavior during the Lebanon conflict unequivocally confirmed this tendency. Democrats and Republicans competed to show that their party, not the rival one, was Israel's best friend. 
One Jewish activist said he thought that it's a good thing to have members of Congress outdo their colleagues by showing that their pro-Israeli credentials are stronger than the next guys. In the end, there was virtually no daylight between the two parties regarding Israel's actions in Lebanon, which is remarkable when you think of the sharp differences between Democrats and Republicans on most other foreign policy issues, like Iraq. For example, Abraham Foxman, the head of the ADL, made this clear when he said, the Democrats who are opposed to the president on 99% of things are closing ranks on Israel, reflecting this bipartisan consensus on the 20th of July, 2006. The House of Representatives passed a strongly worded resolution condemning Hezbollah and supporting Israeli policy in Lebanon. The vote was 410-8. The Senate followed suit with a similar resolution, sponsored by 62 senators, including the leaders of both parties. A number of prominent Democrats, including the party's leaders in both the House and the Senate, tried to prevent Iraq's Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, from addressing Congress because he had criticized Israeli policy in Lebanon. Howard Dean, the chairman of the Democratic Party, who had been targeted by the lobby in the past, went so far as to call the Iraqi Prime Minister an anti-Semite. Supporting Congress for Israel was so overwhelming that it left Arab-American leaders stunned. Nick J. Ray Hall, a Democratic congressman of Lebanese descent said that the House resolution made him just sick in the stomach. To put it mildly, James Zogby, who heads the Arab American Institute, said, this is so devastating. I thought that we'd come further than this. Potential presidential candidates for 2008 like Senators Hillary Clinton, John McCain, and Joe Biden, DDE, as well as former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich went to especially great lengths to convey their support for Israel. The only exception was Senator Chuck Hagel, RNE, who expressed mild reservations about Israel's response and America's support for it. Hagel's comments were largely ignored by his congressional colleagues, as well as the lobby, although they undoubtedly did nothing to further his own presidential ambitions. The mainstream media also stood firmly behind Israel. Editor and publisher, a distinguished journal that covers the newspaper industry, surveyed dozens of newspapers about a week after the war began and found that al. Most none of them have condemned the Israeli attack on civilian areas and the infrastructure of Lebanon. The 24. Our cable news stations were filled with reports and commentary that portrayed the Jewish state as a beleaguered combatant that could do no wrong. Israel did not fare as well on the front pages of newspapers and in the straight-out news coverage in the media. A Harvard study claims that on the front pages of the New York Times and Washington Post, Israel was portrayed as the aggressor nearly twice as often in the headlines and exactly three times as often in the photos. This news coverage was largely unavoidable, however, because Israel was causing much greater destruction in Lebanon than Hezbollah was causing in northern Israel. By the end of the fighting, Hezbollah had killed 43 Israeli civilians and damaged or destroyed about 300 buildings in Israel. The IDF, by contrast, had killed as many as 750 Lebanese civilians and damaged or destroyed roughly 16,000 Lebanese buildings. Given those numbers, the camera quickly became Israel's enemy. Media coverage was also shaped by the fact that both Hezbollah and the Sinira government in Beirut favored a ceasefire almost as soon as the fighting started, while Israel wanted to prolong the war until its leaders real. Eyes that their war aims could not be achieved. Editorial commentary remained relentlessly pro-Israel throughout the conflict. However, and it often crept into the news coverage, thus ensuring that the overall portrayal of Israel in the American media was very favorable. The situation in the mainstream media was nicely summed up in an article in the British newspaper The Independent. There are two sides to every conflict unless you rely on the US media for information about the battle in Lebanon. Viewers have been fed a diet of partisan coverage which treats Israel as the good guys and their Hezbollah enemy as the incarnation of evil. Not only is there next to no debate, but debate itself is considered unnecessary and suspect. What makes America's overwhelming support for Israel so remarkable is that the United States was the only country that enthusiastically supported Israel's actions in Lebanon. Almost every other country in the world, as well as the UN leadership, criticized Israel's reaction as well as Washington's unyielding support for it. These circumstances raise the obvious question. Why was the United States so out of step with the rest of the world? Strategic folly One possible answer is that supporting Israel made eminently good strategic sense for the United States. But that is not the case. Israel's strategy for wag on the war was guaranteed to fail because, as the Winograd Commission notes, the assumptions and expectations of Israel's actions were not realistic. Israel's response reflected weakness in strategic thinking. So the Bush administration was backing a losing strategy from the outset. 
Israel's main goal in the Second Lebanon War was to deal a massive blow to Hezbollah's effectiveness as a fighting force. In particular, the Israelis were determined to eliminate the thousands of missiles and rockets that could strike northern Israel. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert drove this point home when he said, the threat will not be what it was. Never will they be able to threaten this people they fired missiles at. Similarly, the Israeli ambassador in Washington said, we will not go part way and be held hostage again. We'll have to go for the kill Hezbollah neutralization, writing in the Wall Street Journal, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu proclaimed that Israel's goal was straightforward, remove the missiles, or destroy them. Israel had two different but complementary ways to try to neutralize Hezbollah's missiles and rockets. Israeli leaders were confident that they could use air power to strike directly at those weapons and take almost all of them out. They also had a more indirect approach for dealing with the problem. Specifically, they planned a classic punishment campaign, whereby the IDF would inflict massive pain on Lebanon's civilian population by destroying residences and infrastructure and forcing hundreds of thousands of people to flee their homes. Such a campaign would inevitably kill a significant number of civilians in the process. Olmert made this point clearly at a press conference right after the kidnapping, when he promised a very painful and far-reaching response. The aim of the punishment campaign was to send a message to Lebanon's leadership that it was ultimately responsible for Hezbollah's actions, and therefore the country as a whole would pay a great price any time Hezbollah attacked Israel. The Prime Minister was clear on this point as well. The Lebanese government, of which Hezbollah is a member, is trying to undermine regional stability. Lebanon is responsible Blair and Lebanon will bear the consequences of its actions. Both elements of this strategy were destined to fail from the start. Trying to disarm Hezbollah from the air was simply not feasible. Even with an ample supply of smart bombs, there was no way the Israeli Air Force was going to eliminate Hezbollah's 10,000 to 16,000 rockets and missiles. Most of those weapons were widely dispersed and located in caves, homes, mosques, and other hiding places. Moreover, even if the IDF managed to destroy a large portion of Hezbollah's inventory, Iran and Syria would have sent in replacements. Not surprisingly, it quickly became apparent that air power was not having the advertised effect, as missiles and rockets continued to reach northern Israel daily. In fact, Hezbollah launched more missiles at Israel on the 13th of August one day before the ceasefire took effect than on any other day of the war, late July. The Almut government decided to rectify the problem by sending large numbers of ground troops into Lebanon, claiming that Israel would need a few more weeks to defeat Hezbollah once and for all. But this was another fool's errand. After all, the IDF had fought Hezbollah in Lebanon between 1982 and 2000, and Hezbollah had not only survived, it eventually forced Israel to withdraw in 2000. How was Israel now going to achieve in a few weeks what it could not accomplish in 18 years? The ground offensive failed to produce decisive results and Israel had no choice but to accept a ceasefire on the 14th of August. Israel suffered its highest single day of casualties two days before the ceasefire went into effect. The second element of Israel's strategy its attempt to punish Lebanon for allowing Hezbollah to operate freely was also certain to backfire. A wealth of historical evidence and scholarly literature makes clear that inflicting pain on an adversary civilian population really causes a rival government to throw up its hands and surrender to the attacker's demands on the contrary. The victims usually direct their anger at the attacker and, if anything, become more supportive of their own government. Indeed, Israel had twice before launched large-scale bombing campaigns against Lebanon of Operation Accountability in 1993 and Operation Grapes of Wrath in 1996, and both failed to damage Hezbollah in any meaningful way or undermine its popular support. History repeated itself in 2006. In the wake of Israel's punishment campaign, Hezbollah's popularity surged in Lebanon and across the Arab and Islamic world. And most Lebanese vented their rage at Israel and the United States rather than at Hezbollah or the government in Beirut. But even if this case had turned out to be an anomaly and Israel's bombs had convinced Lebanon's leadership that it was now time to disarm Hezbollah, it did not have the capability to do that. Hezbollah was too powerful and the government was too weak. After about two weeks of fighting, with Hezbollah still lobbing missiles and rockets at northern Israel and the punishment campaign backfiring, Israel began to define victory downward. Its leaders began emphasizing goals like eliminating Hezbollah's forward positions and deploying an internal force to protect Israel against Hezbollah attacks back in the United States. The forward reported that sources close to the White House and the Pentagon said that Administration hawks have expressed disappointment and frustration about Israel's inability to deal a swift and decisive blow to Hezbollah. Some of Israel's more hawkish supporters began saying out loud that Israel was in danger of losing the war. 
and a few even questioned whether Israel was still a strategic asset for the United States. Charles Crothamer wrote in the Washington Post on the 4th of August that the war gave Israel an extraordinary opportunity to make a major contribution to America's war on terrorism. The United States, however, has been disappointed in Israel's performance, which has jeopardized not just the Lebanon Opera Shayim but America's confidence in Israel as well. When the war finally ended on the 14th of August, both sides declared victory. It was clear to most independent experts, however, that Hezbollah had come out ahead in the fight. By virtually all accounts it performed well on the battlefield, and it was standing tall when the shooting stopped. It also retained thousands of missiles and rockets that threatened Israel, and its political position in Lebanon and the Islamic world was much improved by the war. Israel, on the other hand, failed to achieve its initial goals and the IDF had stumbled badly when it engaged Hezbollah. It has become manifestly clear with the passage of time especially in Israel that Hezbollah was the winner and Israel the loser. The Winograd Commission was appointed due to a strong sense of a crisis and deep disappointment with the consequences of the campaign and the way it was conducted. Its main findings are an unequivocal indictment of the three main architects of the war, Prime Minister Olmert, Defense Minister Amir Peretz, and General Dan Halatz. The IDF chief of staff damage to U.S. interests, leaving aside the issue of whether Israel or Hezbollah won the Second Lebanon War. There is no question that U.S. interests suffered from its outright support for Israel's actions. As we have made clear, the United States currently faces three major problems in this region. The first problem is terrorism, which is mainly about vanquishing Al-Qaeda, although the United States also wants to neutralize Hamas and Hezbollah. The second concern is the remaining rogue states in the area, Iran and Syria. Both support terrorism, and Iran seems determined to master the full nuclear fuel cycle, which would put it a short step away from nuclear weapons. The third problem is the Iraq war, which the United States is in serious danger of losing. The Bush administration's and yielding support for Israel during the Second Lebanon War has complicated Washington's ability to deal with each of these problems. The conflict in Lebanon has complicated America's terrorism problem in two ways. It has reinforced anti-Americanism in the Arab and Islamic world, with Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah describing Israel during the fighting as having been armed with an American decision, with American weapons, and American missiles. This perception surely will help Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations find new recruits who want to attack the United States or its allies. For example, in a poll taken in Lebanon in late August 2006, just after the fighting had ended, 69% of the respondents said that they considered America an enemy of Lebanon, less than a year earlier, in September 2005. The number was 26%. In another poll taken in Lebanon in late August 2006, 64% of the respondents said that their opinion of the United States was worse after the fighting than before it. Nearly half of the respondents said that their opinion of America was much worse in the aftermath of the war. A Zogby poll taken in the fall of 2006 in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, and Lebanon found that in all five countries, attitudes towards the U.S. have worsened in the last year. U.S. policy in Lebanon contributed to that negative shift in attitudes, although the war in Iraq and Washington's policy toward the Palestinians were more I'm. Important factors, this increased hostility toward the United States will generate more public support for terrorists in the Middle East and elsewhere. Furthermore, the conflict has increased Hezbollah's influence in Lebanonymous. This is partly due to its impressive performance against the IDF, which has normally defeated its Arab opponents decisively, but failed to do so in this case. Israel's bombing campaign was also a major reason for Hezbollah's soaring popularity. When the war first began, many Lebanese were angry with Hezbollah for precipitating the conflict, especially because a banner tour, ice season, was underway in Lebanon. There was also much goodwill toward the United States among the Lebanese people at the beginning of the conflict. Mainly because the Bush administration had played the key role in pushing Syria out of Lebanon in 2005. However, that goodwill toward the United States turned to outrage when Washington backed Israel's offensive. Correspondingly, Hezbollah's standing in Lebanon rose dramatically. One poll conducted in Lebanon after the war found that 79% of the respondents rated the performance of Hezbollah leader Nasrallah as either good or great while another poll found that 40% of Liba, Nice had a more positive attitude toward Hezbollah after the war, while just under 30% had a more negative view, although Hezbollah does not directly threaten the United States. It does threaten Israel and it is aiming to reverse the Cedar Revolution completely, which President Bush supported, and which he extols as a successful case of democracy promotion. By the late fall of 2006, Hezbollah was throwing its increased weight around and threatening to bring down the probe. 
American government in Beirut headed by Fuad Siniora, more worrisome is the real possibility that Hezbollah's actions will plunge Lebanon into another civil war. The United States has worked hard with its allies to prevent this outcome and has been successful so far. But in all likelihood the problem would not have arisen if Hezbollah had not been emboldened by its success and widespread support. The conflict in Lebanon has also made it more difficult to deal with Iran and Syria. While there is no question that both countries support Hezbollah, the United States has a powerful interest in weakening or breaking those links. As well as the link between Damascus and Tehran, driving a wedge between Iran and Syria should not be difficult as they are not natural allies, Iran is theocratic and Persian, while Syria is secular and Arab. Instead, the Bush administration blindly supported Israel during the war and treated Hezbollah, Iran, and Syria as part of a seamless web of evil, pushing them closer together. On top of that, many neoconservators called for Israel or the United States to attack Syria and Iran in the midst of the conflict. Indeed, Mirav Wormser of the Hudson Institute said after the war that many parts of the American administration and almost certainly her husband, David Wormser, and Elliot Abrams were deeply upset with Israel for not having struck Syria as well as Hezbollah. The result? This policy gave Iran even more reason to acquire nuclear weapons, so that it can deter an Israeli or US attack on its homeland. And Iran and Syria have continued to arm and support Hezbollah, while helping to keep the United States bogged down in Iraq, so that it cannot attack either of them. The blowback had other consequences in Iraq. What happened in Lebanon also angered the Iraqis themselves, especially the Iraqi Shia, who feel a loose sense of allegiance to Hezbollah, which is also Shia. Indeed, the Shia rally for Hezbollah that took place in Baghdad on the 4th of August was reported to be the largest of its kind in the Middle East. Have even been reports in the aftermath of the Lebanon war that Hezbollah is training the Iraqi militia of Muqtada al sadr who is a bitter enemy of the United States. United States is in deep trouble in Iraq and cannot afford to further alienate the local population. In order to confront these three issues, terrorism, rogue states, and Iraq in the most effective way. Washington needs broad support from friendly regimes in the region like Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. These regimes have no love for Hezbollah and they might have supported the United States, and tacitly, Israel, had the American and Israeli response been more restrained. Indeed, in the first days of the conflict, the leaders of those countries were critical of Hezbollah for provoking it. But once Israel's disproportionate response was clear and the Bush administration firmly endorsed it, these leaders began to criticize Washington and to condemn Israel. The main reason that they turned against the United States and Israel was to protect themselves from their enraged public. American policy also angered allies in Europe as well as the Middle East, leaving the United States and Israel isolated and short of political clout and raising doubts about whether President Bush is a reliable ally for dealing with the terrorist and proliferation threats. One might think that the sharp cleavage that developed between Arab leaders and their publics during the Lebanon war quickly dissipated when the shooting stopped and thus has had no serious long-term effects. But that would be wrong, as Arab public opinion remains deeply hostile to the United States, making it difficult for Arab regimes to help the Bush administration contain Iran's ambitions. The root of the problem is that the so-called Arab street fears the United States much more than it fears Iran. A Zogby poll released in February 2007 found that 72% of the respawn dents in six Arab countries identified the United States as their biggest threat while only 11% identified Iran. Furthermore, 61% of the respondents said that Iran has the right to develop a nuclear capability, even though more than half of them think Iran is likely to go the next step and build nuclear weapons. It is also worth noting that the IDF's poor performance in Lebanon suggests that it will not be of great value to the United States in dealing with the threat environment that its actions helped create. As we argued in Chapter 2, Israel's policies nurture and inspire terrorist groups and complicate U.S. efforts to deal with rogue states like Syria and Iran. But Israel is not much of an asset for dealing with them. Backing Israel's strategy in its war with Lebanon was not in America's strategic interest. It is hard to disagree with former State Department official Aaron Miller's observation in the middle of the conflict. There is a Dan. Jair in a policy in which there is no daylight whatsoever between the government of Israel and the government of the United States.